Welcome to an all-day seminar with Les Feldick. Study with Les as we go through the Bible in three parts. And now, part one with Les Feldick. We're going to start our program this morning with the theme that's on everybody's mind, and that's the Middle East. Here are these very empires that we normally associate with before Christ are suddenly in the news today. And I had never even realized it or, or, or understood this. But let's look at it briefly, and uh, maybe it'll kind of shock you like it did me, even as I was preparing the newsletter. Back in Daniel, chapter 2, and you remember the setting, Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream that has really astounded him, and then he lost it and couldn't recover it, and along comes Daniel and uh, not only recovers the dream, but interprets it. All right, now the interpretation of the dream then comes up in verse 36 of Daniel 2. <clears throat> Daniel 2, verse 36. And he says, this is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Now remember, this is Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. Verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and fowls of heaven hath he given into thy hand, and he hath made thee ruler over them all. You are the head of of gold. Now, you remember what Nebuchadnezzar saw was a vision of a huge human individual. You usually see it pictured as a Roman soldier type. But anyhow, he sees this image of a human man with a head of gold, the silver chest, and the brass belly, and the legs of iron, and the feet of toes of clay. All right, now this is where we're coming down. Babylon was that head of gold. Then verse 39. After thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee. And that, of course, was the Mede and the Persian Empire. And then there would come a third kingdom, the brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And we know now that that was the Greek under Alexander the Great. Then verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things, iron breaks all these, it shall break in pieces and brood. In other words, everything that had been part of the Babylonian, the Mede, Persian, and the Greek Empire would come under Rome. All right, then as we go on through, we find that verse 41, Thou sawest the feet and toes a mixture, part potter's clay, part iron, and that kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with clay, and as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be part strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave, or they'll not adhere one to another, even as iron does not mix with clay. And then, of course, verse 44 introduces the kingdom. All right, so what we've always shown in biblical prophecy is that beginning with the Babylonian Empire, which was 606 B.C., <clears throat> and in Daniel's prophecy, we had the appearance now and then of the Babylon Empire, or the Babylonian. Then followed immediately by the Medes and Persians, and then that was to be followed by the Greek, and that in turn was usurped, all three of them, by the Roman, which of course carried right on past the crucifixion and the ascension and so on and so forth. And now if you'll come back with me to our, to our timeline for just a moment, we realize that back here in Genesis chapter 12, we have the beginning of prophecy. Now, in our Tahlequah class, we just started teaching in Isaiah, and I've been emphasizing, in fact, many of you Tahlequah people will say, oh, no, I just heard all this Monday. But anyway, the Old Testament is prophecy, prophecy, 
prophecy. Everything is looking forward to something out in the future. And you can start with Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where God told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. Well, what does the I will mean? Sometime out in the future. Well, then along with all the promises of these good things that were in Israel's future, you also had the promises of the bad things. And when they began to fall into idolatry and everything, then the prophecy started telling of the day when God would remove them from the land and they would go into a 70-year captivity under, of course, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and then they would come back. And, of course, by the time they have come back after the Babylonian captivity, the Medes empire has already kicked in. And when Ezekiel writes, Ezekiel is now writing from the capital of the Mede Empire. And then, of course, that was overrun, like we said, by Alexander the Great. Now, the thing that I want to bring out so far as present day now then, this Greek Empire, you know, was split between the four generals. But the general that was over the area of Jerusalem was Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was a Syrian. Even though he was part and parcel of the Greek Empire, Antiochus Epiphanes himself was a Syrian. Now, if anybody knows any biblical history, what was unique about Antiochus Epiphanes? What did he do? Well, he did exactly what we know the Antichrist is still going to do at some time in the future. He went into the temple at Jerusalem and defiled it with hog's blood. And so Antiochus Epiphanes became then, in type, a picture of this coming man of sin we call the Antichrist. All right, then, of course, after that had all passed, then the Romans come into play. And, of course, as you well know then, the Roman Empire was in force by the time of Christ's crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. Now, according to all of biblical prophecy, everything was looking to this top timeline. Now, for those of you in the back, I'm going to have to explain it. Uh, briefly, <clears throat> after the cross, his resurrection, he ascended back to glory. And then according to prophecy, within just a, a matter of a short period of time, unknown of course, but certainly not more than a few years, in would come the tribulation as we call it, the wrath and vexation, followed then by the second coming and the establishing of the kingdom all the way up through the Old Testament, through the four Gospels, through the early chapters of Acts, and on into the little Jewish epistles, and on in through the book of Revelation. This is all on one timeline. And all of this, I hate to goof up my pretty board, but all of this coming from the first coming of Christ until he would establish his kingdom, all of Scripture calls that the last Days. Now, I know that shocks people. They think today is the last days. Well, now it is. But you've got to remember that when the Old Testament prophets were being written, for example, Isaiah and Micah, they write clear back here 700 B.C. Ezekiel writes sometime in the 500s. Zechariah writes about 4, 410, 420. And then, of course, the Gospels are written primarily during, that covers the period, at least, of Christ's earthly ministry. And then when you come into the book of Acts, after Christ has ascended, Peter is still talking about the wrath and the vexation that's coming. And that if Israel would just repent, this would just come and they could go through it and Christ would return and you'd have the king. All right, now to show that, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. <coughs> Because I have to show all these things from Scripture, otherwise you have every right in the world to look at me cross-eyed. Now this is Peter's second sermon, first one, of course, on Pentecost in uh, Acts chapter 2. And now in Acts chapter 3, he has just healed the lame man, if you remember. And the Jews are all full of consternation as to how they did it. Couldn't remember that just six weeks before, the Lord was doing it all the time. But now in Acts chapter 3, verse 19... And see, there is absolutely no indication yet that it's going to be 
anything different than what the Old Testament prophets have been talking about, that after Christ would come in his first advent, Psalms 110 tells us that he would be called back to glory. That's Old Testament. And then it says that would come the wrath and vexation. And so Peter is looking forward to all this in their lifetime. All right, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, this is what he tells Israel. Repent, therefore, and be converted. In other words, have a salvation experience like those who had followed Christ in his three years of earthly ministry. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come. Now what is that? Prophecy. It's coming. It's out ahead of us. And the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. How? By physical, material blessings? No. Next verse. What's he talking about? That God will send Jesus Christ. What does that mean? To fulfill the prophecies of this coming kingdom. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about an ethereal spiritual spirit. Peter is saying that if Israel would repent, then as we see from the little Jewish epistles, they knew they were going to have to go through the period of testing, the wrath of God, but the end result would be the return of Christ. And so Peter is looking forward to that, even in this early day, that if Israel would repent, God would send Jesus Christ who was before preached unto you, back, of course, Pentecost and so forth. Now look at verse 21. <clears throat> Peter knows from prophecy that heaven would have to hold him. And that's exactly what Psalms 110.1 says. Come, sit at my Father's right hand. And what's the next word? Until I make your enemies your footstool. What does that mean? Well, you see, when Christ went back to glory, he would, re he would be at the Father's right hand until the wrath and vexation had literally defeated Satan and all his earthly foes, and he would come victoriously in his earthly kingdom and rule and reign himself. All right, so this is what Peter's talking about, that heaven would have to hold him until the times of restitution of all things. That's the tribulation. That's when the wrath and the vexation of God would be poured out on the planet and getting it cleansed and ready for the coming kingdom. Prophecy. Peter doesn't have a single clue about this line. Now you've seen me even on the program do this over and over, that after... The wrath and vexation had been promised to Israel and the second coming and the kingdom, yet unknown to all of these writers, from Moses through the prophets, through Christ's earthly ministry, through Peter and the eleven, there was not one word to indicate that there's going to be almost a 2,000 year period of time that Paul calls the revelation of the mysteries, which, of course, is the church, which is his body. And now, after the church is completed, 1900 and some years, then, of course, we'll have the church ended. But all right, now I'm kind of running ahead of myself. Let's come back to this scenario right here. After the Babylonian and the Medes and the Greeks and the Romans had run their course, here was to come the wrath and vexation and then the second coming and the kingdom. That was, the, that was the formula. Now, we've done this over and over, but I'm going to do it again. Turn with me on to the little epistles, James, John, and Peter, and Jude, and Revelation. <coughs> we did this at the introduction to the book of James on the program, and uh, some of you are probably going to say, oh my goodness, again, but uh, repetition is the mother of learning. And some of you have probably never heard it at all. But you see, when we got the little book of James, I started with chapter 1, verse 1, of course, to determine to whom was it written. To whom was it written? In fact, you know, I just shared with somebody the other night. 
we had a pastor that uh, had us in for a seminar down in Florida, and a rather large church, and we've been there the last couple of years, and he's also the manager of the, the TV station where we're on in Fort Myers. But he announced to the crowd that night, he said, now I want you people to know that I have four degrees from tremendous schools, including Moody and Bob Jones University and a couple others. But he said, I have learned one thing from this man that those four schools never taught me. And this is it. That when you read the scriptures, the first thing you determine, to whom was it written? Now imagine, graduates of these big institutions are never told that. Well, I was told that by an old country preacher when I was a kid. The first question I ever asked of a guest speaker, and he said, Now, young man, if you want to become a student of the Scriptures, the first thing you learn is always determine to whom was it written. And then, of course, you go on a little more. What were the circumstances? Who wrote it? And so forth but always determine to whom was it written. All right, now here is one perfect example. The little letter of James. To whom was it written? Verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, now you can put the word writing in front of it and you won't do any damage to the text. Writing to who? The twelve tribes. How many Gentiles in the 12 tribes? None. That's Jewish. So James is writing to believing Jews scattered abroad. What has caused them to be scattered? Well, the persecution that arose around that church in Jerusalem when they stoned Stephen, and it was old Saul himself who headed up. And so those Jewish believers coming out of Christ's earthly ministry as well as Pentecost, and Peter and James and John and the rest preaching their hearts out for a few years after Pentecost, then when the persecution came, naturally they scattered. That's human nature. They run for their life. We all do. And then they set up little congregations throughout that part of the Roman Empire, and especially up around Galilee. Archaeologists have determined that, and then over in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. So these are the little congregations now that these writers, James and Peter and John, are addressing. They're not writing to the Gentile church. They're writing to Jews, see? All right, so look at it again. The servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's writing to the 12 tribes who are scattered. Now we know this is sometime in the late 50s, 50 A.D., 56, 57, 58, somewhere's in there. <clears throat> All right, now look what James writes. Chapter 5. I can't look at all of them. We haven't got time. But uh, just to give you a sampling. James, chapter 5, verse 7. Now in the light of all of the pressure that they were already under, you want to remember the early believers were under a lot of pressure from the Orthodox Jew as well as from the Romans, mostly from the Orthodox Jew. And they're already under a lot of pressure. And yet it was nothing compared to what they thought was out in front of them, the tribulation. Consequently, this is the language. Verse 7, be patient. Be patient, therefore, brethren, <coughs> until, or unto the what? <coughs> the coming of the Lord. Now, he didn't expect these people to live 2,000 years. They were going to be living a normal lifetime. But in that lifetime, the Lord was expected to come. This is the top line. Right after a few years of preaching to the Jews, in would come the wrath. Christ would return and set up his kingdom. And then it was the Jews' lot to evangelize the Gentiles. That goes all the way back to Exodus 19. Okay, so with that in line, the top line, with that in mind, and everything is coming within a matter of a lifetime. <clears throat> Be patient to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. He's using farming as an example. The farmer plants his crop maybe in the spring and expects a harvest in the fall, and in the meantime he patiently waits for the sun and the rain and what have you. So James says, in the same way, wait for the coming of the Lord. 
Verse 8, be you also patient like the farmer. <clears throat> Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord, what? Draweth nigh. Now, whenever I teach this, I'm making the emphasis. Drawing nigh is not 2,000 years. That's within a matter of a few years. It's coming. <clears throat> All right, let's go on. Uh, see, I thought I had another one. Okay, go on into Peter. Had one listener wrote the other day, and they noticed my programs were now with me sitting on a stool. One know if there was something wrong. Well, I'd like to just write back and say, no, my wife had been wanting to do this for 20 years, and uh, I just never gave in that I was going to have to sit down. But not because I'm tired or not because I can't, but it does help a bunch to go through the whole day. Okay, verse 7. And again, Peter, now, <clears throat> instead of James, Peter is writing to the same kind of people. In fact, go up to verse 1. Don't take my word for it. <clears throat> Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And again, I like to put the word writing in there because that's implied. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the strangers scattered throughout Asia Minor. Well, who were the strangers in Asia Minor scattered? Jews, see? Believing Jews, these little congregations, and actually they're called synagogues back in James, these little synagogue congregation of Jews who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah. They were kingdom believers, that Jesus was the king, and he had come to give the king and the kingdom to Israel. All right? That the trial of your faith, verse 7, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and an honor of glory at the, what? The appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, when did they expect that? Momentarily. At least in their lifetime, see? All right, then we come on over to um, chapter 1, still chapter 1, verse 20. Now, I know this is shocking for a lot of people, but it's what the book says, and it's so obvious. Chapter 1, verse 20. Christ, up in verse 19, who verily was foreordained, in other words, everything is according to God's plan, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, what was manifest in these last times for you. Okay, in other words, they were to be ready for his soon appearing. Come over to chapter 4, still in 1 Peter. First Peter, chapter 4. Drop down to verse 7. First Peter, chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things. Prophecy. The end of all things is what? At hand. Now, come on. What does language indicate? Is that hand 2,000 years out into the future? No, it's now. See? And so they were being told to expect the end of all these things in the top line to be coming in their lifetime, leading up to the tribulation and the return of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. The time is at hand. All right, be uh, sober and watch under prayer. All right, now let's come on over into 2 Peter. Verse 3. Peter writes, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, when in the world were they looking for these scoffers? They were already with them. They were already being confronted by these scoffers. And what were they saying? Oh, where's the promise of his coming? The prophets told about that. Everybody's been looking for his coming. There's nothing new, see? All right, but don't, don't run ahead of me. I'm coming to it. Come over to 1 John. Verse 18 of chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 
1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children. And so again, John is writing to these Jewish believers scattered, just like Peter and James were. And so he says, little children, it is the last time. Does that sound like 2,000 years from the end? Not to me it doesn't. Little children, it's the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now, today, John says, in 50-some A.D., even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is what? The last time. They were expecting all this to come in shortly. Now let's go all the way even into um, Revelation. Revelation. And that's why one reason I have changed against tradition. I can no longer accept that Revelation was written way out there in 96 A.D. Like most have always said. But more and more evidence is proving now that the book of Revelation was written the same time the rest of Scripture was written because there's not one inkling of the temple being destroyed. There's not an inkling of Israel being scattered or anything like that at this particular time. So it's certainly more appropriate in light of all that John writes that he wrote it at the same time that the rest of Scripture is in the 50s and maybe early 60s. But all right, look what he writes now in chapter 1. <coughs> Verse 1, Revelation 1, verse 1, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must, what's the word? Shortly come to pass. Now verse 3, Blessed is he that reads, that is, this book of Revelation. And especially back in their day, because... Them that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is what? At hand. Now you're starting to light up. You're seeing where I'm coming from. What were they all expecting? They thought all this was coming right down the pipe. Now you're already asking, and now I'm going to ask you, what's missing? What aren't you seeing anything of? The church. The age of grace that was totally unknown to these people. Now the Holy Spirit could have revealed it, but he didn't. Jesus could have in his earthly ministry, but he never did. Because, you see, when the Apostle Paul comes on the scene now, after his conversion on the road to Damascus and his three years out in the desert, which probably was between 37 A.D. and 40 A.D., and he comes up from that experience and begins his ministry amongst the Gentile world, and then when he starts writing his, what we call the church letters, Romans through Philemon, Paul now reveals what he calls the mysteries. And what's the mystery in Greek? A secret. Now, I'll give you one verse, and then we've got to come back to our four empires before we lose sight of them. <clears throat> come back with just one verse in Romans. <clears throat> come back to Romans, last chapter, chapter 16. Verse 25. And see, this is why most of Christendom, if they disagree with me, and many of them do, is because this is what they cannot comprehend. And this is one reason why most of them just absolutely ignore the Apostle Paul and his letters. They don't want to recognize that this man was given things that had been kept secret all the rest of the way through Scripture. Now he says, To him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, not according to the prophets, not according to prophecy in general, but the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation or revealing of the mystery, the secrets. Now watch the last part of that verse. This whole revelation of truth that comes from the Apostle Paul was 
kept what? Secret. Since when? Since the ages began. That's why you cannot find one hint of this church period anywhere up here in the prophetic scriptures. You just can't find it. Now, I've had people write, doesn't such and such a verse. Well, no way, because they're just stretching the envelope trying to make Isaiah make a reference to the church, but it won't fly. There is absolutely nothing in the prophetic scriptures that have anything to do with the church and the gospel of grace, see? And that's why we adhere so strongly to Paul's epistles, because he alone was given these revelations of these things that have been kept secret, see? All right, now I'm going to come back to that again this afternoon, but for now we've got to come back to our four great empires back here in Daniel. Now, according to our top line, I wish I had this in great big bold print so you could all see it, but according to the top line from 606, <coughs> when Nebuchadnezzar overran Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, and Daniel gives the preview of the prophetic time frame of empires. It was Babylon <coughs> to be followed by the Medes and the Persians, to be followed by the Greek, to be followed by the Romans, which would take them on into the coming of the kingdom. And that was the, the scenario that all of these writers, Peter, James, and John, Christ in his earthly ministry, John in his book of Revelation, they're all on this timeline. And you just can't help but see it. Okay, now when Israel continued to reject and reject and reject Peter's preaching, and they stoned Stephen, what's the next event in the book of Acts? Saul's conversion. And what does God tell Saul of Tarsus? I'm going to send you far hence to the Gentiles. Unheard of. The Jews hated Gentiles. You know, I always like to give the illustration. Why did Jonah go out in the Mediterranean and walk the plank rather than just simply go to Nineveh? He was a good Jew. And a good Jew would never go to those pagan Ninevites. So he'd rather drown. That's what he did. He chose to walk the plank than to go to Nineveh. But you see, God had greater plans. God had the fish ready for him. And don't ever cast that off as just a fable. This was as true as anything can be because the Lord himself made reference to it, that even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right, so now then Jonah, because of his hatred, an insipid Jewish hatred, for the Gentiles, just like those Arabs have a perpetual hatred for the Jew. That's why it's impossible to get those people to sign a peace agreement. They both hate each other. Now, the Jews, of course, have, have mellowed. They're, they're not as hateful as they used to be. But you see, they, they were on pretty solid ground because God had always told them, have nothing to do with these pagan Gentiles. Don't intermarry with them. Don't consort with them. Have nothing to do with them. You are my chosen people. Well, you see, the Jew always took that to the advantage. But anyway, you've got to understand that the nation of Israel never had an inkling to evangelize those pagan Gentiles. Now, I can bring you up even closer than Jonah. How about Peter? when the Lord instructed him to go up to the house of Cornelius. Did Peter want to go? Heavens, no. I always say there were footprints in the sand all the way from Jaffa to Caesarea. And even as he walked in the door, what did Peter tell him? Now, Cornelius, you know. You've been stationed in Israel long enough. You know that it is what? Unlawful for me, a Jew, to keep company with you from another nation. And then when he came back from that experience, what did the Jews in Jerusalem do? Boy, they chewed him out royally in the next chapter. And what they tell him? Peter, how could you? You went into a house of Gentiles. And then horror of horrors, he even did one worse yet than that. What was it? You ate with them. How could you? 
Well, you see, that was the mentality of the Jew. That's why I got it up here, Jew only. Now, of course, there were exceptions, like Nineveh, when God forced Jonah to go to Nineveh. And we have Ruth the Moabitess, and you have Rahab the harlot. There were a few exceptions. But by and large, God is dealing only with the nation of Israel to the coming of Christ. All right, now let's, before the hour is up, I want to bring you on over to the whole scenario that was in place for the fulfilling of the prophetic program <clears throat> has now been interrupted. We have now gone 1,900 and some years during this age of grace where there is no prophecy. See, you and I cannot say, well, the rapture is at hand because this has happened and this has happened. No. The rapture has been imminent ever since Paul's day and all the way up through church history. If they taught the rapture, it was taught as it could happen today because there is nothing associated with prophecy with the end of the church on earth. And that's why I'm always telling folks, don't try and put the church up into the tribulation because this is insulated from prophecy. There is nothing in the prophetic program associated with the church. All right, so here we are now. We think we're at the very end of the church age. And now the tribulation is once again out in front of the human race. Now here's the part I want you to see. The whole earthly political scenario has now come full circle and we are again just like it was back here. What do I mean? Okay, what ancient empire did we just destroy a couple months ago? The Babylonian. Babel, you know that. Now, I put it in my newsletter, so I'm running ahead of it. What is the next empire that's going to have to be dealt with? The Mede and Persian. Well, who's the Mede and Persian empire today? Iran. And all of a sudden, we're realizing that this whole terrorism is coming out of Iran. It'll be dealt with. You just wait and see. I can just about guarantee it. They'll be the next on, on the agenda. Oh, but now, now it gets exciting. Who's going to be the next one? Because like I already showed you, the Greek Empire was divided into four quarters, and Antiochus Epiphanes was a what? Syrian. What's the next empire that's going to be dealt with after through with Iran? Syria. Now then, once we get Iraq out of the way, Iran's going to be next. Then will come the, the uh, Syrians, because they were the predominant part of the Greek Empire. All right, we got one left yet, the Roman. Okay, what's taking place in Europe? Oh, the European community is getting stronger and stronger and stronger every day. And I've been telling my Oklahoma classes, all you have to do is watch your business page, not to buy stocks and bonds, but to see how the European companies are constantly buying our American. All the pharmaceutical companies are now owned by Europeans. All of the food companies, General Mills and Ralston and you name it, owned by Europeans. And then you remember in one of my newsletters, <coughs> two, three times back, I said, watch Western Europe. And don't let the fact that Western Europe has now gone from 10 to 15 to 20. It may even go on up to 30. Don't let that bother you. Because I said the 10 originals are going to maintain veto. Remember that in my newsletter? All right, now just the other day, there was a half-page article in the London Financial Times explaining just exactly what I said. That even though the European community is growing to 20, 25, or maybe even on up to 30 nations, the original 10, which are called the Western European community, have final say. It's still under control of the original 10. Now, let me give you the original 10. I think I've got time. I always have to go back and look at my note on that one or I'll miss one of them. Here's your 10. I usually take the three little ones first. Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. The Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Then the next four are France, Germany, Greece, and Italy. 
Am I going too fast? Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. Those are the three little ones. Those are the three that I think Revelation speaks of as being disappeared and then there will only be seven and then the Antichrist sets up his kingdom. That's the eighth. Well, I think those three will be the ones that go. Then France, Germany, Greece, and Italy. And then the last three are the United Kingdom or Great Britain, Portugal, and Spain. Those ten nations got together right after World War II down at, of all places, where? Rome. Rome. And what did they call it? The Club of Rome. And from that ten nation agreement to rebuild the European community and make it a United States of Europe, for the longest time it was just those ten nations. I can remember reading the news magazines and every one of them, Time, U.S. News, and all the rest, always called them the Ten. The Ten. Many of you will remember that. Well, then they changed the name from the Western European community to the European community, and that's when it started going beyond Ten Nations. But the Western European community is still intact. They are the ones who will exercise final say, or what we call veto power. And that's where I get the ten toes of Daniel, will be those original ten from the Club of Rome. All right, and they are ready for world dominion. Something is going to happen that America will sooner or later go down and the European Union, or in the Western European Union, will come to the fore. So now here we are at the end of the church age. Politically and everything, we got the same scenario. So now then, when I read the book of James and it says that the time is at hand, what can I say? Hey, that's us. <laughs> See? When Revelation says, which shall shortly come to pass, then I can say, that's us. Now we are the generation that's looking at all these things. Now, to me, that is the miracle of Scripture. That's the miracle of our sovereign God who is in total control of time and history. He's never a day late. And we're right on the threshold of all these things coming to pass. Well, Romans 11, verse 13. Now, remember, this is all by Holy Spirit inspiration. Paul doesn't write from his own feelings or his own idea of himself. Everything he writes to the last jot and tittle is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I'd take this book and pitch it and go home. But this is the inspired Word of God. And this is what he says by inspiration. Verse 13 in Romans 11, For I speak to you Gentiles. See, inasmuch as I am the singular apostle of the Gentile. Now, that's not an accident. That's exactly what God wants us to know, that the apostle Paul is our apostle. Now, let me show you, whereas Peter, James, and John were the apostles of Israel. Turn a few pages past Romans and go to Galatians. We may get there this afternoon again, but just to give you an idea why I single out Paul's apostleship for us today. Verse 8. For he, speaking of Christ, God, however you want to look at it, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? Israel, the Jew. And who is the apostle of the Jew? Peter. See? So Peter, the apostleship of the circumcision. Well, the same God, Paul says, was mighty in me toward what people? The Gentiles. See that vast cut right down the middle? Peter, James, and John were apostles to the nation of Israel. Paul was God's apostle to the Gentile. Now, you see, even Peter, at the end of his life, admonishes even his Jewish people to recognize Paul as the apostle of record. All right, let's go look at that, and then we'll come back to Romans. 
Look at Second Peter, chapter three. And I use this verse especially with Roman Catholics, who, of course, you know, have been had, had it ingrained in them that Peter was the first pope. And so Peter is, you know, preeminent, way above Paul because of his stature. I would know, wait a minute. Even your so called first pope tells us where to go. Look at it. Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. Account. Understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. That's the whole theme of Scripture, is to bring human beings to a knowledge of salvation. In fact, I, I, I just prayed yet early this morning, Lord, don't let anyone sit under my teaching over a period of time and slip into eternity lost. But it isn't what I say that to do, it's that the Lord can save the individual by his faith, see? And of course, it's my responsibility to show them what to believe. And what to believe is that Christ, the Son of God, the creator of everything, suffered the death of the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's the gospel. And all you do is believe it, plus nothing. And then... After salvation, we go into a life of works, of course. But look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 again. And account or understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul has written unto you. Now, I established in the first hour, who was Peter writing to? Jews. Jews. And now what is Peter telling his Jews? Paul has already written to you. Well, what letter did Paul write to the Hebrews? The Hebrews. <laughs> That's pretty self-evident, isn't it? And so Peter concludes that the letter of Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul. There's no room for argument. And so he says, you go to Paul, even as he has already written unto you. But I missed the main part. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him. Well, where did God give Paul all this wisdom that's for us as well as Jews? Those three years out in the desert to start with, and then, of course, progressively through his ministry. And so Paul refers to that wisdom that Peter calls here, as the revelation of the mysteries, which was something that Peter had no idea. But Peter knew that Paul had something that he couldn't share. And so he tells his Jewish people, you go to Paul. And why can't people read that? Don't ask me. I can't answer it. But there it is. Peter himself writes to his fellow Jews, you go to the epistles of Paul. Paul because of the wisdom that God has given him. And then he goes on in the next verse, which tells you why Peter doesn't even attempt to do what God gave to Paul, when he says, as also in all his epistles, not just the one written to the Hebrews, but in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things pertaining to salvation, in which... That is, in Paul's epistles, are some things that even good old Peter had to admit are what? Hard to be understood. Now, just let that soak in a minute. I sometimes think I go so fast that people just sort of let it wash over. Let it soak in. Peter is telling his fellow Jews now from this day forward. Now, this is at the end of Peter's life, remember. Second Peter is the last thing that he wrote before he's martyred, just like Second Timothy ended Paul's life. Now, at the end of his life, Peter is by inspiration again instructed to tell his fellow Jews, from here on, you go to Paul's epistles, because that's where it's all at. Now, we don't throw the rest of the Bible away, otherwise I'd go home right now. But everything that Paul writes rests on everything that went before. 
And that's why I like to use this top line as an introduction to a day like this, that this is everything that was basic to what will come through the revelation of the mysteries when Paul is designated now to be the apostle of the Gentile. Okay, now then come back to Romans 15, that verse 8 that we were ready to use. And hopefully all these things will, will make an impression on you. Romans 15, verse 8, where he writes, I say then that Jesus Christ, now remember, I always have to emphasize, who was Jesus Christ? He was the creator of everything. Never lose sight of that. That Jesus of Nazareth was the creator, God of Genesis 1-1. Never forget that. If he'd been anything less than that, he could have never paid the sin debt for the whole human race. Think about it. There is not another religious system on this planet where their religious leader has purchased the salvation and paid the sin debt of even one person. But you see, Jesus Christ, as the creator of everything, had within him the power and the wherewithal to do it. And that's why we can, without apology, claim that there is no other name given among men whereby a man can be saved. You can't be saved by believing in Buddha. You can't be saved by joining the Mohammedans. You can't be saved by joining any other religious group. There is only one way of salvation, and that's why we can say it without apology. We don't have to take a back seat to anybody. We have got the answer. And most Christians don't understand that. Scared to death we'll hurt somebody's feelings and we'll give them the idea that we've got something they haven't got. We do. Don't we? Yes. We do have something they haven't got. Not because we're better. You know, I told a class the other night, there is nothing in God's plan of the ages that makes a white man better than a black man or a red man. Not one iota. God is not racial, but by virtue of our redeeming grace, now we are head and shoulders above the lost world because of grace, because of his saving power, that's all. I'm not any better than my lost neighbor, but I'm certainly a lot better off because I have eternal life in front of me and he doesn't. All right, so here it is that Jesus Christ, the creator of everything, was, past tense again, a minister of the circumcision. Now, we've already established. Who are the circumcision? Israel. So Jesus Christ, speaking now of his earthly ministry, was a minister of the nation of Israel. Now, read on. By the truth of God, wasn't something Paul dreamed of. This was in God's eternal purposes that Jesus Christ would be a minister of the circumcision and for what purpose? To confirm or to fulfill or to bring to total fruition the what? The promises made to whom? The fathers. Well, who were the fathers in Scripture? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all the rest of the prophets coming up through the Old Testament. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12. And again, I usually like to make the point that 99 and 9 tenths percent of prophecy is directed to the Jewish nation. Everything was directed to Israel. Israel was the very core. You remember, I think, on my last taping, I used the analogy of a wheel. I don't care whether you take a wheel off an old prairie schooner or if you take a wheel off of a present-day hot rod, whatever. A wheel is a wheel. But I like to use the old covered wagon because that's a little bit easier to picture. Now, if you've got the wheel off of a covered wagon, it'll roll without that steel tire around the, the wood part. It'll roll. 
you can take out maybe half the spokes and it'll still roll. But you take the hub out of the wheel and what do you got? Nothing. It won't even turn half a turn. All right, so now my lesson is Israel is the hub of God's wheel. Israel is the hub. Other parts can fail and fall apart, but not Israel. And that's why the promises in the Old Testament are that Israel will never, never, ever disappear from the world. They're there to stay because they're intricately at the heart of God's program for the human race. All right, back to Genesis 12. You're already there and I'm not. Verse 1. Now God had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and away from your kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I, what's the verb? Will. Now as soon as we go into future, what is it? Prophecy. Here's the beginning of prophecy. Now I know God promised in Genesis 3.15 the coming of the Redeemer. But other than that, this is the beginning of true prophecy. The appearance of the nation of Israel. All right, now read on. I will make of thee a great nation. What is it? Prophecy. Something that's going to happen down the road. I will bless thee. I'll make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. Now watch this because this has never been canceled. This is as true today as it was the day it was spoken. God says, I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curseth thee. And then here comes the promise of the Redeemer. And in thee, through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel, would come the Messiah. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not just Israel. All the families of the earth would be blessed through this nation coming out of Abraham. Prophecy, promises. Promises, prophecy. All right. Now then, because of the situation in the Middle East today, I want to take this very slowly because this is front page material. As some of my class people here in Oklahoma have put it, I'd rather pay five bucks a gallon for my gasoline and remain a friend of Israel as to cow town to the Arabs and have 20 cent gas. And you better believe it. Because as long as America is a friend of Israel, we can expect God's blessings. He's promised it right here. But the moment our government stabs Israel in the back and they're constantly being pressured to do it, we're gone. We're out of here. Maybe not in six months or a year, but in a short period of time, Miss America is going to go. And so our only hope, and that's why I tell people constantly, you pray for our president that he will not give in to the pressure. And he's under tons of pressure to give in to the Palestinians and let them have what they want and turn against Israel. The day he does, well, you remember those of you in my class in Oklahoma, back in the first Bush administration when I saw what James Baker was saying about the Jews, I told my classes over and over, this Bush will be a one-term pres one president. And he was against all odds. My, after his ratings, after the first Gulf Wire, War, he should have been a shoe-in. Bill Clinton should have ended up in the dustbin of history. But instead, Bush and James Baker turned against Israel, pressured them, and we've seen the results. All right, now let's hope that this President Bush will not do it. So far, he's been holding fairly tough until this last few weeks. But again, you have to realize He's not only under the pressure from the godless secular governments of Europe. He's also against the godless near secular religious leaders of America. And they're godless. Some of the Presbyterian people just sent me some of the stuff from their national meeting here a week or two ago. And I'll tell you what, it's frightening. 
It's frightening what the religious leaders are trying to push on to the lay people. And they can't stop it. That's what's so frightening. But anyway, here are the promises that God will bless those who bless this nation coming out of Abraham. All right, turn over now just for sake of the, the um, physical, earthly promise. Come over to chapter 13. I'm sure most of you know all this. You always have to be, remi be reminded, Iris and I went to a Bible conference, oh, years ago. We were just newly married. And the guy got up to speak that night, and this is what he said. For most of you here tonight, he says, I'm not going to be saying anything new. You've heard it over and over and over, but he said, we do it just like meat and potatoes. We never get tired of it. But he says, for some of you, you're going to hear something you've probably never heard before. Well, I was one of them. <laughs> I heard something that night that I'd never heard before, and it just opened my eyes. Well, that's the way I have to feel whenever I teach something like this. For most of you, it's just another helping of meat and potatoes. You've heard it over and over and over, but for some of you, it might be rather new. All right, Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord, the same Jesus Christ of Romans 15, the same God of Genesis 1-1, the Lord. Now in the Hebrew it was Jehovah and they had such an awe for that name that they didn't even like to print it. So it's usually Lord in capital letters. And the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art. Now remember Israel has a hog back of mountains right down the middle. You get up on one of those high areas and you can see the Mediterranean to the west and you can see way beyond the Jordan Valley to the east. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. All four directions, as far as you can see. Verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee, God says, I will, what do we got again? Promise and prophecy. I will give it. See? And to thy seed forever. We're still under that. God has never reneged on that promise that the land of the promised land belongs to Israel. Not just part of it, all of it. And not just that strip between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, but everything from the Nile River in Africa clear out to the Euphrates and the Persian Gulf. That's the promised land. See, most of us got the idea that it's just that what we call the little land of Israel. Uh-uh. That's just a little sliver. The promised land goes clear out beyond Baghdad and down to the Persian Gulf, which will one day be Israel's homeland. Okay, now then let's come on over to chapter 17 and refute Arafat and these Muslims who are, whether you know it or not, maintaining that Jesus Christ came through Ishmael and not Isaac. Yeah, two years ago last Christmas, I happened to hear that one. Uh, oh, Arafat spoke from Bethlehem and he just about screamed. We are the people from whom Jesus came. Jesus was born through the line of Ishmael, not Isaac. And then I think I shared with somebody here not too long ago an article I had read, I think it was just before we left on one of our other uh, seminar tours, where it listed something like 18 or 20 of our major American newspapers starting with the New York Times and the Washington Post and the L.A. Tribune and so forth. And every one of those American newspapers had had an editorial proclaiming that the Messiah, that Jesus of Bethlehem, had come through Ishmael. And consequently, that just makes the Muslims just smile from ear to ear, see? But now look what the book says. <clears throat> Genesis 17, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, which of course brings in the H factor. 
And the same way with Abram was changed to Abraham. And I think basically because the letter H is the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and the fifth number always speaks of God's grace. All right? So now not only is his name changed from Abram to Abraham, but now Sarai is to be changed to Sarah. Verse 15, 16, And I will bless her, I will give thee a son of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And then Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear, that is, have a child? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. I've got him. Oh, that Ishmael might fulfill this promise. Well, see, that's what the world, the Muslim world, would like to think, that this is where it all began. But we'll read on. Verse 19, And uh, God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. Now watch it. This is where it's all at. This is where it gets important. And God says, I will establish my covenant with him, Isaac, for an everlasting covenant, one that will never end, and with his seed after him. Now, just to make sure that it's plainly understood, God goes one step further and he says, as for Ishmael, the son that was now a teenager, probably 13 if I'm not mistaken, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. I'll make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. You know how much they've multiplied? You know how many Arabs there are out of Ishmael compared to Jews out of Isaac? Fifty to one. Fifty to one. That's the numbers that Israel is up against. Unbelievable. See? All right? Verse 21. What's the first word? But. Yes, I've blessed Ishmael. He's going to have multitudes of people. But. My covenant that he had made with Abraham. My covenant I will establish with Isaac, not Ishmael, Isaac. All right, now then, come all the way up to chapter 22. And again, you know who the Muslims claim was offered by Abraham? Ishmael. Yeah, they like to tell the world that Ishmael was the son that Abraham offered. But it wasn't, it was Isaac. But the, the important part is, <clears throat> how does God refer to Isaac? Genesis 22, verse 2, where God said, Take now thy son, thy, what son? Only son. And what does that tell you? God never recognized Ishmael in the plan of redemption and so forth. He wasn't even considered a son. He was a, well, he was the child of a slave girl, not of his legitimate wife. So I guess you could almost say he was a stepson, see? But nevertheless, God does not recognize Ishmael as such. He says, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and so forth. Well, anyway, we got to keep moving. So here come all the promises now concerning this nation of Israel. And um, just to show you that it's passed on into the next generation, turn with me to Genesis chapter 26. We'll take it probably in, uh, in sequence for a little bit. Now in Genesis chapter 26, Verse 1, Genesis 26, verse 1. And there was a famine in the land, that is, in the land of Canaan. 
beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, under Gerar, which was down toward Egypt. Verse 2, And the Lord appeared unto him, that is to Isaac, and he said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Which is Canaan, of course. Now verse 3, Sojourn or dwell in this land from which God is speaking, the land of Canaan. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee. I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, that is, the Canaanite tribes, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. You see that? Everything that God had promised to Abraham, God is now shifting over to the shoulders of Isaac. Nothing has changed. The promises are going to keep flowing through these patriarchs, see? All right, so everything that was promised to Abraham is promised to Isaac. All right, let's move on. Jacob comes in next. And uh, Jacob, of course, had that same understanding that they were not to leave the land of Canaan, but they were to stay right there, come drought or whatever. But there comes a time. Now come on up to Genesis. I think it's 46 or 48. I have to look a second. 46. Genesis 46. Now we're already up to Jacob. And his sons are grown. Joseph has already been down in Egypt a while. He's gathered the grain. And uh, another famine. All right, Joe, uh, Genesis chapter 46. <clears throat> so Israel, Jacob, took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. Now that's down in the Negev desert, straight south from Jerusalem, straight east of Egypt. If you can picture that. Verse 2, And God spake unto Israel, or Jacob, in the visions of the night. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. Now watch this verse. Verse 3. And God said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. Now remember what God had told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob up until this time? Don't you touch Egypt. You stay in the land of promise. But now God says, Don't fear to go down into Egypt. And here's the reason. For I will there, in the sojourn in Egypt, including the slavery, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And so whenever it comes up in Sunday school or in Bible study or someone just asks you at work, where in the world did the nation of Israel come from? You say, well, the start of the promises made to Abraham handed on to Isaac and Jacob, but they became a nation of people while they were in slavery in Egypt. That's where they multiplied and became a nation of people. All right, now let's just move on for sake of time to Exodus chapter 1. And God, in his own sovereign way, in spite of the pressures of the slavery, is multiplying the number of the children of Israel. Verse 7 of, the, of Exodus 1. Exodus 1, verse 7. <clears throat> and the children of Israel were fruitful. Now remember, they're under bondage. They're working in the in the brick kilns. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was what? Filled with them. Now look, people have been people from day one. When these Egyptians saw the Jews beginning to multiply, what happened? Hey, they got worried, wouldn't we? 
Wouldn't we, if all of a sudden an immigrant group from one particular country had come in and we just realized, hey, they're, they're outnumbering us. They are multiplying ten times faster than we are. Well, we'd get shook up too. All right, and so the Egyptian pharaoh said, hey, we've got to do something. Now, they couldn't export them. They couldn't deport them. Because, like I always point out when I teach Exodus, you've got to remember that these Israeli slaves were, again, the core of their economy. You take away the workforce, and what does the nation have left? Nothing. And that's what these Jews were. They were the workforce. You know, the first time I taught this, I think way back when we started on television, I used the example. What would the American farmer do if all of a sudden the government took away all of his machinery? No tractors, no combines, no tillage equipment. Go out and grovel with a hoe. Well, what would happen? The country would be devastated. We'd be in a famine mode in six months. Well, Egypt was no different. These Jews were the heart of their workforce. All right, and yet they got to do something because they're multiplying so fast. All right, now then verse 8, So there rose up a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And verse 9, he said, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. They'd already outnumbered them. Now, here's another point I want to make with regard to our so-called Middle East situation right now. I just happened to think of it. I better share it with you while I'm thinking. When they go into this peace process, no matter how much they agree to, there's going to be one thorn that I don't think either side will ever give in. And I put this in the last newsletter as well. And that is the right of return. The right of return. Well, you got almost, that's what made me think of it. You see, back in 1947, when Israel was coming out of their kibbutzes and establishing their farms and their production, and the Arabs, of course, were coming in, taking advantage of the work opportunities, which they've always done, the Arab world around them knew that they were going to have to fight a war to destroy these Jews who are now coming into the Middle East. And so all the Arab governments around Israel, from North Africa, Libya, Egypt, Lebanon to the north, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan, all those Arab nations around the little nation of Israel consorted together and begged the Arab population living amongst the Jews now, to come out, come to their various Arab countries, and they would sustain them so that the Arab armies could come in and wipe out the Jews without any compunction about killing Arabs. Sound logical, doesn't it? If all you Arabs will come out and just leave the Jews there like sitting ducks, we can send our armies in and just simply annihilate them kill every last one of them, and you can go back and have the whole shebang. That's actually what they did. If you don't believe me, get up on the Internet. You can probably find it. Okay, how many left voluntarily between five and 800,000 of these Arabs dwelling in the land of Israel left voluntarily up to Lebanon, out to Egypt, Jordan, whatever. But... The Arab armies didn't wipe out the Jews. They got their butts kicked. And Israel won the War of Independence, declared themselves a sovereign state, and Harry Truman, remember, was the first one to agree that we would recognize Israel as a sovereign state. So, those Arabs that fled couldn't go back. They no longer had anything to go back to. The Jews wouldn't let them. All right, so now then, those 500,000, 800,000 Arabs that left in 1947 and 48, now remember that's 55, 56 years ago, have now multiplied to over 5 million. 5 million of those Arabs are sitting out there in the Arab world thinking that they can one day go back and the Jews can be driven out. Well, do you think Israel will ever agree to that? No way. 
And do you think that Arafat or the rest of them will ever agree to anything less? I don't think so. And so it'll never be settled. Israel will say, we'll not let them come back. And the Arab world says, we won't give you peace until you do. So just watch for that as they start negotiating things in this peace treaty. Well, you see, when numbers enter in, it's just like today. If Israel were to let those five million Arabs come back into their sovereign state of Israel, they'd be outnumbered again. Well, today, today the numbers are there's around, uh, I hope I'm right, I think there are around 800,000 again Arabs living in Israel, but there are three million Jews. Got those numbers? There's about three million Jews living in Ar Israel but around 800,000 Palestinians, they like to be called now. I call them Arabs. All right, but what if you add five to 800,000? Well, then you'd have 5.8 million Arabs and 3 million Jews. It won't work. It'll never happen. And so I don't think they'll have any peace treaty. Okay, now, you got the picture then of what happened in Egypt. They were starting to be outnumbering the Egyptians, and so down came the horrors of the Egyptian bondage, hopefully to stop their having so many children. That was the idea, that if they could just stop the number buildup of these Israelites, then they could keep them as their workforce without being overrun. Well, anyway, you know the story that... Through the plagues, God brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, I've always used the number five million ever since I first started teaching, and uh, I'll tell you how I arose at the number five million. The book of Numbers tells us that Israel numbered 600,000 men of war when they went out of Egypt. Well, you just go into your little calculators or whatever you want to use and just stop and think how many total people would you have to have, including grandparents and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters and what have you, to end up with 600,000 men of war between the age of 21 and 25 and single. Well, you've got to have a minimum of 5 million people. And I almost felt like I was out in the wilderness all by myself using that number five million. But see, now they're coming up with seven to eight million that came out under Moses. So I see that number over and over. So now my five million doesn't seem quite so obnoxious. But nevertheless, Israel now is the largest single tribe of people in that part of the world, and that's why they're called a great nation. Now, compared to numbers today, no. They were only five, six million. That's what, New York City? Is that about what New York is? Something like that. But whatever, for that day and time, it was the greatest nation in the Middle East. Okay, now they come out and they're gathered around Mount Sinai, and now you jump all the way up to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. They are now a nation of people, 12 tribes, under Moses. And they're gathered around Mount Sinai, out there in the desert. And now look what the Lord does. Now you've got to remember that back here in, in the Old Testament economy and even up early in the New Testament... God would appear to these people in human form. You have that over and over. And here was another one. See, God comes down to Mount Sinai and he calls Moses up. Verse 3, Exodus 19. So Moses went up unto God, that is, up in the mountain. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, to the children of Israel. Now, they're synonymous. Verse 4. God says to Moses, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Well, they didn't sprout feathers. They didn't fly. But their exodus was so miraculous that it was as if they took wing and flew. See? Now, there's another place I've got to stop a moment because we're not going to get there this afternoon, I'm pretty sure. Jump all the way up to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. 
Revelation chapter 12. Now, of course, we teach prophecy again, and especially this seven-year period of time. We know that Daniel splits that seven years in the middle. The Lord himself does now with regard to, as we are as church-age people, he splits it in the middle. And the reason being that at the midpoint of that final seven years, I might as well use this line because this is where we are now. And once the church is out of here and God picks up where he left off with Israel and the tribulation begins, at the midpoint, you see, there's going to be again an escaping remnant of Jews. And that's all it'll be, will be a remnant. It won't be all of them. It'll be a remnant. And they're going to go out into the mountains. All right. This is going to be an exodus much like it was way back here out of Egypt. And that's why scriptures use this parallel. And so as Egypt or as Pharaoh pursued the Jews out of Egypt and would have overrun them there at the Red Sea, what did God do? Well, he miraculously opened the Red Sea, let the Jews go through on dry ground, and when the Egyptians attempted to follow, he let the water come back and destroyed every one of them, and Israel was safe on the other side. So many of these things fit. They're perfect parallels. All right, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. And this is at the midpoint of the tribulation because the Lord himself said it in Matthew 24. That when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee to the mountains. And we know that Daniel says that desolation is going to happen at the middle of the tribulation. And so I can do this without apology. At the middle of the tribulation, here it is, verse 13. So when the dragon, the Antichrist, now indwelt by Satan himself, when he saw that the, he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. Well, who in the world brought forth the Messiah? Israel. So we're dealing with the nation of Israel. Verse 14. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Now, they didn't sprout feathers. They're going to fly or drive or whatever. They're, they're going to be on the ground. They're not going to be flying. But to the nation of Israel were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. A supernatural exodus into her place where she is nourished for one year plus two years for a total of three and a half years. And God is going to protect this remnant of Israel from the face of the serpent or from Satan and the Antichrist. Verse 15. The serpent, now remember, beginning with the middle of the tribulation, Satan indwells this man, Antichrist, just like he did Judas at the first coming. All right, and so through this man, Antichrist, verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. Now this is symbolism. So what does he, what does he cast out? A command. And what is that command? Just like Pharaoh told the chariots, pursue those Jews. Go out and destroy them. Don't you let a one remain alive. And so an armed force of some sort or other will pursue these escaping Jews going to their protected place in the mountains. All right, and so the command is that water out of his mouth like a flood goes after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away or to be destroyed by this command. Now verse 16. But the earth, not the Red Sea this time, it's going to be the earth, the open desert. And the earth helped the woman, this escaping remnant of Israel. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up this armed force that's pursuing. See? And it swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now you have to put this symbolism into reality. 
when the Antichrist gives the command from Jerusalem, destroy those Jews heading out into the desert, naturally it'll be an armed force of some sort that will pursue after them to annihilate them. But before they get there, the earth opens up and they're swallowed up. Now again, you have to know your Bible. Has this happened before? Huh? Sure, don't you remember when the sons of Korah back in Moses' day said, Moses, you've got too much authority. There's no reason why we can't offer fire at the altar. Remember? And what did God tell Moses to tell him? You assemble out in front on the next morning. All of you who are following Korah, just assemble out in front and we'll deal with it. How did God deal with it? The earth opened up and swallowed up every last one of them. Now those aren't legends and tales. Those are real events. And so all of this just shows us how God is capable of opening up a cavern underneath this armed force and it's just going to bury them alive and Israel will go into their place of safety. Okay, back to Exodus, chapter 19. That isn't the part I wanted to bring out, not at all. <clears throat> Exodus 19. So the Lord says, you see how I have given you wings of an eagle so that I could bring you unto myself now look at the promise and prophecy. Verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed. In other words, if the nation of Israel would be an obedient nation of God-fearing people, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Now, the covenant that's coming in chapter 20, which is the covenant of law where Israel will go under the law with its temple worship and so forth. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. Now look what the promises are. Now this is exactly what Paul was talking about in Romans when he said that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm or fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Here's one of them. If you will keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure. Now, the word peculiar in the Hebrew does not mean what we think as something odd. It means something of intrinsic value. The nation of Israel was to be of an intrinsic value in God's economy. And you shall be a treasure unto me above all people. And what right did God have to say that? The earth is mine. What does that mean? He's sovereign. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's created it. It's his. Now, just to show you how perfectly this fits. Well, read the next verse, and then we'll go back. Verse 6. Now God says to the nation of Israel, You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, come all the way, keep your hand in here, come all the way back to Peter. All the way back to Peter. I've got to look a minute whether it's first or second. I think it's first Peter. Yeah, 1 Peter, chapter 2. Now, I hope you still got your hand back during Exodus 19, because I want you to flip back and see how identically these words fit. Now, remember what I told you the first hour? Who is Peter writing to? Jews. Who is God ad addressing back at Sinai? Jews. Now, look at the language. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says, you are a chosen, you are a special generation. You are a what? Royal priesthood. What did Exodus say? You shall be a kingdom of priests. What does Peter say? You're a royal priesthood. Paul doesn't use this kind of language. This is for Israel. All right, read on. You, Peter says, are a holy nation. What did God tell Moses? You'll be a holy nation. 
Next word. You are to be a peculiar people. What did God tell Moses? You'll be a peculiar nation. All fits. See, that's why I've gotten almost enamored with this top line, how that all of this was going right down the pipe. And in this period of time, after his ascension, when Peter writes to the Jews, he's in full accord with what God told Moses. Everything was in full accord. But Israel rejected it all in unbelief, and so God drops down here and turns to the Gentile. But you have to stay up here to get the picture of how God is dealing with the favored nation. Okay, now then let's come back to Exodus 19. <clears throat> Because you, this, is, this is basic. This is basic to understanding the prophetic program. If you can't understand these things back here, you'll have a tough time understanding these things here. All right, now then Exodus 19 again, verse 6, you shall be a kingdom of priests. Now what's a priest? A go-between. Is he talking about the tribe of Levi? No, he's talking about the nation. So who was to be a priest? Every Jew in the nation was to become a priest of Jehovah. A go-between. Well, between who and who? Between the Gentile world and Israel's God. This was their prospect, that every Jew would be a priest of Jehovah, not just the Levites, every Jew.